Hi, this is The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi, founder of The Complete Herbal Guide. And today I'm very excited to introduce my new guest, and it's Leah Rachel, and she comes from a literary background. Her grandmother is a published author and poet, and her uncle also co-authored a well-respected book in the 1970s. Leah has been writing short stories since she was a little girl, and she is an author who is in the middle of promoting her new book, Seek and Forgiveness. That's very exciting. So tell us a little about yourself and what you do, and um, let's hear it all. Well, first, thank you very much for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. And um, yeah, so I, I'm Leah Rachel. I've been writing since the time I was a little girl. I was a creative writing major in college and had my first short story publications in college. Um, and then uh, probably in order to pay the bills, I went on to graduate school and developed a career as a professor. So I'm a professor at the University of Missouri in St. Louis. Um, so I live in St. Louis with my husband and son and um, I write uh, novels and publish them as well. So this is my second published novel, Seeking Forgiveness. Um, it's about interracial adoption. So it's, it's a narrative memoir, I'd like to say. So my family is interracial. We did interracially adopt. Um, and so a lot of the stories and vignettes in the book are based on our personal life and things that happen. But it is a, not, it is a I'm sorry, a fiction book, not a nonfiction book. Um, I did that primarily for, to protect my son. Okay. So his backstory and his history is really his story to tell, not mine. Right. Mm -hmm. So I fictionalized some of the things around him so that to protect his privacy, but um, wrote in general about interracial adoption and a story about um, a family that interracially adopts and what happens. Wow, that's very exciting. You know, so many people um, find that um, it's very hard to adopt. And, you know, and a lot of people I know even have problems because their their nationality and culture was different than the child's nationality and culture. And so, you know, the adoption agencies gave the parents a little bit of a problem. Now, did you find that when you were trying to look for a child to adopt? Well, it was so it was interesting. A lot of people assume that we adopted because of fertility issues, but that's not actually the case. Um, we sort of, in all honesty, were on the fence about um, becoming parents at all and having children. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were sort of like waiting and trying to decide. And a colleague of mine assu who assumed it was a fertility issue, she did tell, um, suggest that I go to like this workshop of women support group. Um, right. women and you know who are and, and whatnot it was a colleague so I figured I better go to um you know say I went and um and it was at this group that you know like you were saying I I met a number of other people who were having fertility issues and were considering adopting across racial lines and a lot of other issues and I learned about some of the issues and it's also where the idea of um uh, adopting through the foster system sort of came to like I hadn't even thought of it before, like wasn't on my radar. Right. Um, and I think it isn't on the radar of a lot of people who are looking to build families. They don't always think of that option. Right. Uh, but when it sort of, I thought about it for the first time, I was like, well, if building a family is about, you know, more than just like me and what I want, but it's also about the child, uh, then I was on board and, and sort of definitely wanted to do it and came home from that meeting and told my husband and we like signed up and so, um, you know, in the classes, we did learn that if you are going to, you don't know what sort of placement you'll get. So you don't know, you know, going in, you're going to get it an interracial family. But, um, but we did learn a lot in the classes and you do, you know, going in, you have to know that, you know, be aware of other experiences, be aware of the child and what their needs are. And those needs might be, you know, you learning about other cultures and you learn, you know, making the effort um, to sort of get out of your safe space sometimes yeah uh, which is what I think parenthood and motherhood is all about in general but it is it really is <laughs> Now, this was, you know, a huge step for you. And, it, you know, it must have been at times very stressful, very happy. You know, there's a lot of emotions going on when you're going through all this, you know. And what brought you to the point where you wanted to write this fictional book? What, you know, um, yeah. what motivated you to, to want, you know, even though it's fictional, what sure. drew you to it? Well, you know, I, I get um, a lot of questions from people, from friends, from family, from other people, either questions about our experience, or I'll sometimes tell stories that, and they'll be like, really? You know, that's shocking, or I had no idea. That really surprises me. And so um, there was a, a, a night where I was sort of 
I would cuddle my son to sleep sometimes and I was holding him in bed um, and, and I just think recounting some of the sort of things that had happened to us. And I thought, you know, I, I want to write about this. Like I, 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 on some level, feel like I need to write about this. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you a story right around this time when I decided to um, start writing about the book was when my son turned five and it was time to take him to the dentist for the first time. So I called around, I, from friends, I got the name of the pediatrician. And so we went, you know, made the appointment. I told my son, he's you know, going to get a lollipop and, you know, it's not so bad. And we went, we walk in and then the um, receptionist behind the like partition, you know, she looked at us through the partition and then closed it and went away for a while and came back and looked at us very skeptically. And she said to me, well, I need your papers. And I remember saying like, oh, well, here's our insurance card. I don't, you know, I don't know what you, what you want. She's like, no, no, I need your papers. And I'm like, I, I genuinely don't know what you're asking. And she said, well, for us to treat the boy, we need um, approval from his parent or guardian. You can't just see him without approval for, you know, from whoever's responsible for him. I'm like, I'm his mother, like I'm <laughs> responsible. And, and she literally was like, well, you need to prove that. Wow. And who goes to the dentist with papers of adoption or birth certificate? I mean, who I've never that? heard so of it. You know, we had to leave. And so, you know, we're in the car and my son's like, do we still get a lollipop? I'm like, I'll get, you know, as I'm buckling and then I'll get a lollipop. And then I, I get in my seat and I put the car in reverse to back out of the parking spot. And I look over my seat and I make eye contact with my son. And he says to me, did we have to leave because I'm black? <sighs> and I said to him, wow. no, I said, no, baby, we had to leave because I'm white. And I bring this up because I do feel like, so this happened right around the time I said, I need to start writing a book about this. But yeah. um, you know, it, it's been a effort of mine to make sure that he doesn't blame himself yes. when things like this happen. Um, Cause that was when he was five, but we, we had incidents occur, you know, even earlier. Yeah. And, and these are some of the things that are in the book, like when do you start discussing race with your child? When do you explain, like, how do you explain something? These are like, really tough issues that I try to write about in the book. So even though it's a fictional book, it's kind of based on some non-fictional areas of your life, you know, that you've gone through. Just you use different probably character names. Did you use different characters? Yes. So just to protect the people in your family. Now, I find sometimes when I get into my most, you know, motivational times of my life is when I'm going through, you know, really obstacles and tragedies in my life I feel like that's when so much pours out of my heart now did you feel like that also yeah well you know it was interesting so what happened was um so right before this I'd written um and after my last book was published I actually wrote a whole other book it's not been published or anything I wrote a whole other book um and it had uh you know some it, it, I I tried to get it published it wasn't getting that great of a reaction and I kept getting because it was definitely fiction pure fiction and I was getting you know write what you know write what you you've lived and so I remember one morning I write in the mornings I just sat down on my desk my cup of coffee and I just poured out like a, a letter to my son um you know saying like you know should we have adopted and you know what are like you know just the sort of the seeking forgiveness which is the title of the novel some of like the themes of the book and I remember mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to write the novel then I was just sort of pouring out some feelings um that were very strong and writing does help me get through some of these emotions like you were talking about and I put it away for a few weeks and then when I brought it back out I thought well this is probably going to sound awful <laughs> <laughs> but I reread it and I thought you know that's really not awful and I'm writing what I know, I'm writing what's very emotional. And I know that, again, a lot of people have asked me questions about and been curious about and want to know more about. And so I was like, let me just keep going with this. Yeah. And then I kept, and, and I have so many of the emotional um, moments in our lives in there. And it really was, I feel like beneficial for me to process them. And I hope it, on some level, like a love letter to my son for him to see, uh, you know, how we, we went through some of these things as a family. And I think, you know, that you have to also realize that you're not alone, that there are so many other people probably going through the same issues. And as you even speak, I, I know one couple that went through very similar issues, just like you. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's very taunting, you know, our society, you know, you know, each, each, you know, decade grows up a certain way. And even though it might not be the right way, 
you know, when people are brought up in an environment and th certain things are embedded in their mind, you know, that's what they tend to believe. And sometimes those beliefs are hard to break, even though they see it, the truth right in front of them, they still, you know, the things that they were brought up with stay in the back of their head. And yeah. sometimes it's very hard to break. Yeah. Well, I have to say, you know, I feel like, you know, the target audience for this book is probably, you know, families that have interracially adopted. But beyond that, there's also just adoption in general. I mean, I have stories in there that I think relate to just adoptive parents, um, you know, as well as families and whatnot. But, you know, for Mother's Day this year, earlier in the summer, I wrote, I, I had published in, you know, local newspaper, an article about motherhood. And it was a little bit like um, very early press for this book. And I, right after that was published, I got a number of emails. I had one um, elderly woman write, you know, in like big cursive handwriting, um, and, and send with me a picture of her interracial family, you know, her son's, you know, much older, she's in her 80s now. Um, but I got all this response from people saying, oh, my God, thank you for finally writing about this. Um, I'm sure it was, you know, so much, uh, you know, more difficult for the, for the woman who'd done this 50 years ago. Uh, yeah. But people saying, you know, there's not enough literature about this, not enough stories told. Um, and, you know, we really appreciate your writing about this. And it was just so touching, because I felt like, you know, all those hours spent writing and editing and, you know, re-editing yeah. are worth it when so many people are curious about the topic. I have to say, I believe if, if, if it helped, you know, while you're writing it, if it helps you, then it's definitely going to help somebody else out there. And it, it's not about, it's not about the quantity. It's about the quality. And if you could help one person out there, then yeah. you've reached your goal, you yeah. know, and this is definitely a great topic, I feel, because it's not it's not talked about enough. You yeah. know, you don't really hear about adoption and interracial adoption. You hear people talking about how hard it is to adopt and they want right. children and so forth and the process they have to go through. But you don't really hear about interracial adoption. And, and it really is useful to think about. I mean, so, you know, I a little bit also you know, to an earlier question you had. I mean, when we were going through the process of fostering to adopt, I mean, we did you know, hear about and run into people who didn't believe in interracial adoption and didn't right. believe um, that white people could safely adopt, especially a black son. Yeah. And I remember, you know, and this is in the book, when I first heard this, I was a little surprised, but then Kate, you know, worked to understand the issue and said, I, I get it now. I totally get it now. If you're not, you know, going to make the effort, it can be sort of uh, not good for the child who will feel out of place and maybe unaware of his own culture. So it is, really important. I mean, I will say the good thing about this book, you know, it is my second one. My previous one was about like, uh, you know, women in the 1500s, who, you know, didn't have much choice and yeah. uh, who they married and whatnot. So that book was a little sad. This one's much more hopeful. I mean, this one does present a lot of these issues. Um, it does present a lot of these difficulties. Um, and, uh, and I do know that, um, I mean, I have a very, very close friend who's told me, you know, she just had a long discussion with other friends about whether, she, you know, she even believes interracial adoption is a good idea or not. So I know these are out there issues, um, but the book, at least I feel like gives a hopeful account, yeah. um, which is, I feel like we need hope today. We do need hope. And you know what, what bothers me is it's, it's just a shade. A sh you know, we have every culture has a different shade, quote unquote. So what makes, you know, because, because, you know, certain com communities, certain cultures might have a darker shade of color, they're still the same person inside. Yeah. We all are the same person inside. It doesn't matter how we look on the outside. Yeah. It doesn't, you know, it, what matters is, is that we are the same inside and, yeah. and we think the same, we feel the same, we react the same, we yeah. love the same. Yeah. So why, why can't we be treated the same and looked yeah. as an equal, yeah. you know, on an equal level, you yeah. know? Yeah, I agree. And again, I think, you know, one of the themes that comes up in the book is just how surprised, so the book is, you know, from the mother's perspective, how surprised she gets when people, um, you know, don't see them as a family or don't see them as a cohesive unit, which on some level, you know, also gets that doesn't see, you know, what's maybe in, inside of them and judges from the outside. But again, this relates to, you know, uh, any, any family that's adopted, I mean, I have a story when my son was, was turning one for his first birthday, a really good friend of mine since college days flew out to be there. And, um, and while she was visiting at some point, I mentioned how, you know, when Hanukkah comes up, we always, my father was Catholic, but my mother was Jewish. So we celebrate Hanukkah. 
and we were going to buy presents. And I remember this friend of mine said, wait a minute, you're raising your son Jewish? And I said, I don't know. I mean, a little bit. And she was like, I thought his birth mother was Christian. I said, yeah. And she's like, well, then you have to raise him Christian. And it struck me one, because I didn't understand how that would work if I yeah. identified, like how I could, but what really shocked me was just that other people did not see our family as a cohesive unit. Like I see adoption as permanent. I mean, I feel like my son is of my flesh and blood. I mean, I know he's not, he, I didn't give birth to him, but it's like, for me, we are a family, like any other family, like, you know, if, if it's inconceivable for somebody else to be told to raise their son a different religion than they are. <laughs> it should be inconceivable to say that to an adoptive parent as well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's amazing sometimes how other people don't view, you know, you how you see you. They don't see the inside of you. They don't see our family as a cohesive family. Um, and it can be shocking. And, um, you know, it's been interesting to learn how to deal with some of this. I feel people are very easily open to be very opinionated and give their opinions, but you cannot give your opinion unless you walk through that person's shoes. How do you know how that person feels and how can you judge how that person feels if you have not walked through their shoes? You know, you might feel completely different if you went through what that person went through. Right, 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 right. um, Right, and I think I think that's one of the reasons it's really important for um, parents of interracial families to make an effort to learn about other cultures because you can't um, know everything. You can't, you know, uh, understand other cultures. So you really have to make the effort and just be open minded. Yes. So just, you know, don't act like you do know everything. Don't act like, uh, you know, every, um, you know, you sort of know what a child's going through. Um, and again, these are sort of themes that are I just feel like you know broader for just families in general. Yeah, um, it's hard to, you know, I mean, it's hard for me to even know what it's like to be a boy, Ooh, right? You know, a little yeah. black boy. So like, it's, it is really important for us to be open minded and like willing to listen and willing to communicate. And, and sometimes it can be tough. I mean, I, you know, my son went through a phase. Um, and this, you know, is in the book as well, when he was younger, um, when I would ask him to like brush his teeth at night or do his homework. And his response to me was, you don't know what it's like to be black. That would actually be his response. And I would say, sweetie, you are right. I have no idea. I still need you to brush your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> and then we move on, uh, you know, so I'm acknowledging he's right. I'm not going to say like, I know what his life is like, but right. you still need to brush your teeth. You know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and kids also know how to manipulate, you know, they, they could try to change things around to right. get off the topic because they don't want to brush their right. teeth. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, if, when he realized he wasn't going to get currency from that in terms of not doing his homework, you know, it, it was a phase that passed, you know, it, it definitely passed. <laughs> yeah. Now what, you know, you have a profession, you, you know, you are a professor. So you, this, you know, writing was like a, a secondhand job in a sense, because you already have one career going. What motivated you to focus, you know, so much attention to get this book done? You know, what, yeah. you know, what, what, what motivated you? Cause it's a lot of work to write a book. It is. And it's funny, you know, like a year or so ago, I was having lunch with some of my colleagues and I asked them if like their current job as a professor was their, you know, number one job or their like second best choice. And, and surprisingly, nobody wanted to be a professor. <laughs> like one colleague wanted to be like a private investigator, but they could choose anything, you know, another one to be like a stunt man. And, um, and so, and I, I always wanted to be an author. I mean, I really, like if I had been born independently wealthy and hadn't had to worry about anything, I would have, you know, tried to be an author from the beginning. And I feel like I almost wish I hadn't been as risk averse as I was and I had because it continues to be my passion. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I do believe, um, and you probably understand this, you know, if you have a passion for something, you, you find a way to sort of do it. And do. I mean, I, very similar to what you said before, I do feel like writing and maybe one of the reasons I like it so much is it is cathartic. I mean, I, it's like therapy for me. Yeah. Um, and so I sit down every morning um, and I write every morning for two, three hours, like non fail. And, um, and I feel so much, I mean, if I'm like sick or have a cold or something, or I'm on an airplane and I can't, I don't feel as good that day. Like yeah. I, it really is, um, useful for me. And, you know, I've been doing it so long that I feel like I've honed some of the skills, you know, I've gone to Iowa writers workshop and stuff like that. And, um, 
it's just a passion. And when it's a passion, you, you find a way, I think. You really do. And I, you know, I love that you journal because, you know, I, I talk about it in many of my books as well, because I, I feel like when you journal, you, you get those repressed emotions out and they go on paper and it's actually therapeutic. And you actually sometimes can learn after you read what you've written you come to conclusions that you didn't even realize, you know, it's, it's therapeutic and, and you're also learning and edu educational at the same time. And it also, I think, helps a person move on to the, you know, and they, so they don't get stuck and stagnant yeah. in the area yeah. that they're in. Yeah. So I, I think that's great. I really yeah, do. I mean, you know, so some of the um, stuff I wrote about, I mean, there was, so I think, you know, all families have like the crazy uncle or like, you know, just relatives who are different than you and whatnot. And, yeah. um, you know, and I did, I did have one family member that really did not seem, I don't know if approving is the right way word, but necessarily like certainly understanding uh, of our adoption. And, um, and I wrote about it a little bit in the book, but I did notice when I wrote about it um, initially, it did help me process it. And it did help me also realize a little bit you know, where the uncle was coming from, the perspective. I mean, yeah. I, I still feel like he's got work to do. <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, but there is something to trying to understand. I mean, part, part of the problem, actually, this uncle of mine's from overseas. And I, I do feel like it was a language barrier, a little bit, some of what the problem was, because English wasn't his, his native tongue. And so I, writing helps you, like, think through and process some of these things. And yeah, and, and it's interesting, the, you know, it's all coming from your own head and you start to realize new things when you write it down, for sure. And I feel like, you know, um, sometimes, you know, family members sometimes feel that they have the right to voice their opinion about things. And, you know, um, sometimes, you know, I was going to ask you even before you just you just started the conversation, how did you deal with other people? Because, some, you know, with their own opinions, you know, because everyone, a lot of people, you know, always have something to say and sometimes that can be very hurting to the other person mm -hmm. and sometimes you have to develop a thick skin and yeah. and I spoke with somebody and I was telling them about you know some of the instances that I went through and people were very opinionated to tell me what they thought and sometimes it was very hurting what they said yeah. and the person stopped me and said you know what that's not your problem it's something it's their own issues and what they're going through. So sometimes we get hurt by other people's opinions, but then we have to stop, just like you said, yeah. and they're having their own issues and maybe they were brought up differently or maybe they went through things in their own life and they can't comprehend, you know, the decisions that you're making, yeah. but it doesn't mean that you're wrong, you know, and yeah. You have to, you know, did you have to develop a thick skin or did you have to just realize? Yeah. So it's interesting, you know, what you're saying. And there's, you know, there's, there's, I feel like two aspects to that. I mean, one is when things are sort of said to me and I have to decide whether to respond in the moment or not. But I think, you know, for me, the harder, and more difficult and bigger issue is what happens when they happen in front of my son. Yes. So, you know, we've had people ask me if I have any real children too, and he's been standing there. Um, I, I had people ask me like, you know, if I breastfed him when let's like, and I think, and it's funny because I think sometimes what was happening was some of these people are trying so hard to be inclusive that like, they don't know what to say. So they're trying to just act like, uh, everything's the same as every other family. And so like, like they'd ask me weird questions, uh, but the bigger, what I'm trying to get at though, is when it was in front of my son, I was always like, I want to put them in their place, but I don't want to make him feel bad, but I know that we're going to have to talk about this later. And so those are the hardest moments for me. Um, and, uh, and again, you know, some of them a little bit documented in the book, you know, what, what happens when people say sort of offensive or, you know, non-inclusive things right in front of my son. And I have to say, I mean, I've gotten better over time. Mm -hmm. And I do think that like everything, uh, every response is different and tailored to the environment. Um, yes. But I do think it's, you know, useful to address these things organically as they, as they happen. Yes. So you know, when somebody asks me if I have any real children too, in front of my son, um, yeah, I'll, I'll later real children. Oh my God. Yeah. I later, you know, pull my son aside at, like at night, especially and be like, you know, what can we talk about today and, and what happened? And, um, and I noticed usually he tries to not um, really pay attention to what happens. So right. it's hard for me to know like how much I should push it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I say like, I, I let it go organically. Like I bring it up 
I think he's tired of me saying to him all the time, you know, we can talk about anything. You have any questions? Like we can talk about anything. I've said that so many times. Um, but these are, these are just really tough things that I feel like, um, are, like, I mean, thank you for the show. Cause they're not talked about enough and people have a ton of questions about them. Yeah. And, um, it's, it's, and anybody who's a parent knows, you know, there's no guy. I mean, I feel like the hardest thing about motherhood is there is no answer key. There is no book where you can look up, you know, what age. I've said that out. so many times. <laughs> you know, like you know, they talk about the first 12 months, but what about the rest? <laughs> yeah. You know, what do you what do you do when he's like 10 years old and he's like, I hate my life? Like, how do you, yeah. you know, reply to that? Or you find that he stole a pack of gum from the gas station? Like, how do you how do you like there's no answer key? And so yeah. um for me, that's been the hardest part about motherhood. And I feel like all parents will relate to some of that, you know, in this book. Oh, definitely. You know, and I think it, it could actually relate to even things that are are not just interracial, you know, um, some of the lessons that you show in your book, I think people could actually learn, you know, and apply it to different situations because, mm -hmm. you know, how old is your son right now? So my son is 12 right now. Okay. So he's about fifth, sixth, sixth grade around, right? Well, he's seventh. Yeah. He's, he's a very late birthday. So he's like the youngest in his class. He's actually okay. in seventh grade. Yeah. So, you know, he's in middle school now. And uh, how did you feel in school? Did you get somewhat some, um, you know, racial remarks from the teachers or teachers didn't you felt like weren't treating you or your son the way they should? Well, that's another one of those um, issues that I sort of feel like I wasn't aware enough of before I, I became the parent and that um, my white friends are clueless about. So, you know, when... Um, uh, so my, we made a really big effort to find a good preschool for my son that was interracial and had interracial families just like us. So it was a great preschool. But then when it came time for kindergarten, I didn't know exactly where to go. So um, the idea was I was looking for a school that um, was, because we were probably going to move, that was like majority Black and very highly, you know, academically rated. And mm -hmm. my ignorance or white privilege or whatever as, as a white woman was to not realize how difficult it is to find that. Yeah. So, and I talked to black friends and I you remember when my really good friends said, you know, she's like, well, I'm, I'm moving to an all white neighborhood. My son's going to be the only black kid in school, but I'm okay with that because he's going to be a lawyer or a doctor. And I want him to get used to that kind of environment now. And he can get all his culture when he comes home to us. Right. And that was good for her. And I remember her telling me that and more than one of my black female friends telling me that, but then I realized I can't make that same decision because he'd be the only black kid and then come home to us too. Right. So I actually made a different decision for kindergarten. We moved to a neighborhood that was not as academically highly ranked, but had a good uh, diversity mixture, still not majority African-American, but a you know, good diversity ranking. Yeah. And I have to say it was the wrong decision. It was I mean, I hate to say okay. this, but why do you say that? Because the school, um, it's, so I am a working mother and, and yes. I really, uh, and I thought, well, you know, what can I bring? So when my son comes home, since I am a professor, you know, I can help him with the schoolwork. I can't bring the diversity so I can help him with work. Well, one, I've learned that one parent or two parents on their own cannot rescue a child from a failing school district. If a teacher doesn't return your calls and won't tell you what's going on, um, you know, I didn't learn until the end of second grade that, so my son is ADHD and he's a little hyperactive. The teacher had put him way in the back, like uh, separated from all the other students. So she just ignored him for the entire, you know, the last day of class when we went to pick him up, I noticed his desk was way in the corner and that he'd been ignored for months at a time. That could be one of the reasons he had ADHD because he was reacting to the, the things he didn't like. He was trying to bring attention to himself because they're pushing him away. You know, it's pretty obvious, you know. And I was horrified. I was horrified. And, you know, when he needed help in math, I went to the school and said, you know, we have extra tutoring. And, and they said to me, you know, we only have so much money and we can either help tutor in reading or math. And we, as a school district, have decided that, you know, an adult can't survive without reading, but they can survive not knowing math. So we don't yeah. help them in math. We don't give any help in math. And I remember thinking like, okay, there's no help in math. The teachers are ignoring them. So we moved. I feel bad for my son, but we moved in third grade to a different mm -hmm. school district. He's not the only black kid in the room, but the diversity is not as good, but it's higher ranked. And now he's getting all, at least a lot of tutoring and a lot of help. Um, but it's been, this is one of those things that I think 
um, as a, certainly as a white woman, I was not as aware of going in how difficult finding a good school for my child was going to be. And, you know, I, I, I can relate, but not interracially, but, you know, my, my, one of my children is transgender and that child came out in high school and that, you know, for years, my son, who is now a woman yeah. was bullied. And I never knew because at that time, you know, she kept it to herself. And yeah. then when certain things happened and I went to the school, yeah. I could see, you know, I, I read body language. So someone doesn't have to talk to me. I could just look at their body language and I could see exactly what they're thinking. I know I, between their eyes, their arms, their legs, how they're crossed. Yeah. And I could see that they were judging my child accordingly to their outside appearance and not by what they were feeling inside. And they weren't considering the child's emotions or what the child yeah. was going through. It yeah. was the outside. So, you know, it upsets me when I see a, I see people judge people according to their shade of skin, you know, how they addressed, you know, yeah. it's not what's outside, it's yeah. inside. And people yeah. sometimes can't get past that because yeah. they're very ignorant. And again, it's either what they went through in life or in the environment they grew, went, lived in, you know, and yeah, you do understand for sure. And yeah, I mean, that's why I feel like the you know, audience for this book is really, um, anybody who sort of had a family and, um, it, I mean, experience things like that. I mean, yeah, you, you definitely understand very well, you know, and I have to say <clears throat> the school district we moved out of too, you know, I was sort of hoping my son would make some good friends there and that, would, but, um, he, he was, you know, the problem was my husband and I would pick him up from aftercare and a lot of the students there noticed that his parents were white and started bullying him about that sort of saying you know saying well you're an orphan you don't have any parents and you don't have any parents and he was like he came home like you know what does the orphan even mean and I was and yeah. so he you know bullying can come from lots of different places especially and, now with social media too mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and yeah you know we got to protect our children it's tough motherhood parentage in general it is a tough thing and, I feel and like adults could be things. just as bad as the children I thought you know I was very naive I thought when when people grow up you know because I I came from a very um you know liberal college and I thought when people get an education and they grow up right. and they and they you know they they change you know because now they're adults and that immaturity has left them but not so a yeah. lot of people are very immature and still hold very ignorant um, ideal uh, behaviors and thoughts in their brain. And I, I agree with you. That's, you know, it's, again, you know, one of those things sort of <clears throat> I learned as I get older, like it can come from family. If you don't. Yeah. Well, I always and say the apple come... doesn't fall far from the tree. And you're right. I mean, it, it, you know, it would be interesting sometimes to try to understand, you know, what in their childhood made them that way and whatnot. And, you know, you, you want to give people a little bit of understanding, but at the same time, you know, you got to protect your children. And, um, and it is just surprising. And I'm with you too. I sort of thought like colleagues in education, we better, but they're not all, all, always either. No. So, you know, I mean, I feel like I'm sounding prejudiced or elitist because like I assumed quote unquote educated people would know better, but no, yeah. like, and so yeah, you have to have a clear mind about everybody and everything. And I have to say, when it comes, I, I know people who were adopted and, you know, when, you know, some people had found their, their, um, their biological parents, but they never considered them their biological, they, they consider, they know that they were their biological parents, but their mm -hmm. parents were the people who raised them and right. loved them. And mm -hmm. that was always their, their, right. their mindset. And, yeah. you know, you know, it was funny. So my mother was a psychologist and I remember her once telling me, I probably was fighting with her, and, you know, Told her I didn't like her as my mother or something. But I remember, <laughs> her telling me, I remember her telling me she's like, "Well, you do know the um, the fantasy of having different parents. It's very common. Like the Harry Potter series is based on that. You know, like there's so many um, so many children uh, wish they had different parents. And so when my, my mother told me that, and I assumed it was like all children. And it was funny because like not that long ago. Um, I said something to my son, like, you know, you probably wish you had a different mother. And he was like, no, like, I love you. Like, and Aww. I was like, I thought all kids, you know, wish they had different parents. Um, but it was really sweet because he, because I could tell like my bringing up because the notion to him was almost like, I I've never thought that. Why are you saying that? Mom? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's, 
So what is, what is the main goal that you're trying to accomplish with this book? Like, what would you like people to mainly get from this book? Because it seems like, you know, you're taking your own experience, you're taking all those journals, all the things you went through in life, you're clustering yeah. up into a book that could actually have principles and give educational knowledge to someone at the same time, they're reading it and they're enjoying a story, but yet they're learning from it at the same time. Yeah. So I, I think, uh, I think a couple of things, I mean, one, I, I, the main thing I was first thinking about was just providing the perspective um, of motherhood um, and interracial adoption. Because again, you know, I, I hear stories from other or questions from other people, but you know, my own experience, as I've said, like I was surprised about, you know, how hard, you know, finding a good school would be. And, you know, I was surprised by families' reactions. So I feel like um, providing a perspective is, is sort of like, you know, a big thing that the book is trying to do. Uh, but another thing I really do feel like is hope a little bit. Um, I mean, the book is uh, primarily about, again, motherhood and the title Seeking Forgiveness is about seeking forgiveness for all the mistakes you make as a mother. You know, you hope you're doing it right. And you hope, you know, when your kid later goes on the therapy, they don't blame you for everything. Uh, but you, know, you don't know. But um, you know, the book does sort of, and so the, you know, somebody once asked me if I like the mother in the, in the book, Seeking Freedoms, which was interesting because I don't present her as perfect. She makes mistakes and she says stupid things and yells at her son sometimes when she shouldn't. Um, but the idea is a, a love of a mother for her son can overcome a lot. Yes. Parental love is so strong and so important yes. uh, that it can give hope even when things are really tough. And I oh, think yeah. that's hopefully what is one of the main things that comes out of this book. You know, and I, honestly, when you say the word perfect, I don't believe in the word perfect. I don't even think it should be in our vocabulary, to be honest with you, because no one on this planet is perfect. We have the media trying to give these fake, you know, images of people that are quote unquote perfect, but perfect doesn't exist. We all make mistakes. That's how we learn. We learn through our mistakes in life. We try to do the best we can, especially as parents. I think people don't understand that, you know, like you said, there was no book, you know, I, I didn't, you know, after tw 12 months, you know, it was like, all right, you're on your own. And, yeah. you know, there was a lot of things that even that book couldn't even help me with, you know, yeah. that I experienced, you know, yeah. you know, raising children yeah. and, you know, and a lot of things pop up that you never knew or imagined and well, you, have, you do your and, best. And we have to give ourselves grace and, you know, a measure of like, you know, forgiveness. I mean, you know, there's I, another story. I, for um, a while, I used to volunteer at something here in St. Louis called Room at the Inn, Ratty, where um, homeless families, it's usually mostly mothers and children, you know, who come and spend a night and get dinner. And so I would do sort of the dinner shift. And uh, I started taking my son with me because, he could play with the children like he my son's very extroverted he loves playing you know more people to play with so he mm -hmm. was happy to go you know we went I mean we were volunteering together for like three months and then um we're and then we get in the car again my son has a penchant for asking me important questions in the car um we get in the car after like three months of volunteering at room at the inn and as we're driving out he says to me you know why are all the people homeless people who come there black and it dawned on me that for the past three months, they had all been black and the volunteers were all white. And of course he was gonna notice the difference. And again, in the moment, I didn't know what to say. I, I remember that I just started rambling about like institutional racism and some people, yeah. you know, are dealt cards that are harder and they try their best. And, you know, I just started, I literally, I think I rambled into slavery. <laughs> you go home with my giving this like random historical thing to like, you know, a seven or eight year old, whatever he was. And I remember we get home and, and come to the front door and I say to him like, you know, do you want to talk about this more? You can ask me anything. And he was just like, can I just watch some TV now? <laughs> <laughs> and I remember in that moment thinking, I probably did not handle that well. I, I, I needed a more pithy response. I needed, I do think parents should think about how to talk about racism before it comes up a little bit sometimes, you know, like, and so I don't think I did the best job, but like you said, we need to forgive ourselves. We need to give ourselves grace. And I do believe the most important thing is just keeping the communication open and yeah. hopefully he'll come back and ask me more questions about it and I can try again. And I think sometimes our emotions take over. And I think sometimes, you know, even, you know, even though I always think before I talk, sometimes your emotions take over and you sometimes don't always 
think say you know it's just your emotions you know take over and you've been through so much with the interracial adoption and you've 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 gotten some emotional abuse from your family members and from people in society and from from people in the schools and even from doctors like dentists and so forth and it's it's very rough when you know especially when your child is is absorbing all this it it takes a toll on them and they you know people don't understand but you know how our children are raised makes them the person they are and when when they see negative behavior you know in our society you know in a sense it, it it can't hurt them and you know so as parents we do the best we can to protect them and to make them understand that not everyone in this world is going to be nice and unfortunately you know n- nobody is perfect and we can't control other people's actions but in our home we can try to give them the best love and the best you know protection and do the best we can and i think that goes a long way because it's kind of like a nest when the, when the bird comes out of the egg we do the best to raise them and then eventually they fly away but they always come back especially if the household is healthy they'll always fly back to the mother, you know, and, you know, that's how we have to kind of think about it. You know, we can't control other people's actions. We can only control our own. And we, you know, we're always going to make mistakes here and there, but the best we can do is learn from our mistakes, admit to our mistakes, and then try our best, you know, the next time to do it better. Yeah. And just love our children. You know, it's funny. Somebody asked me if my son has read the book and he knows about the book, of course. And when I first finished it and had like, you know, a final draft 10, like ready, you know, ready to go, like I had it printed out on my desk. And I said to my son, when he woke up that morning, like, you know, the books, the book I'm writing about you've done, you want to come see it? And he came down and he saw the stack of papers and he's like, where's the book? That's just chasing <laughs> like, whatever. Um, and, uh, and he knows all about it, but he hasn't read it. I haven't read it to him. And I don't know when or if he will, but I feel like, you know, my son, you know, you're saying like, they're going to grow up and they're going to go off in the world. And I, you know, I like I, I like to imagine him in college, and um, you know, maybe some he's having a tough time, and he looks over, and I it's a thin book I've like stuffed it on his bookshelf when I moved him in. He can look over and see that book and know that it's all it's a mother's it's a book about a you know mother's love for her son, and that I wrote it like to and for him. And yeah. he can see it even if he hasn't read it, and just know that it is a sign of a immense love. Yes, and, and he can feel comforted. So I don't know when he'll read it, um, but he'll always know that I have this like love letter to him that I wrote. Yeah. And I have to say also, even with, with my son, you know, who transgendered to a woman, I knew since my child was a baby that, you know, my child was, you know, either gay or transgender you know, and so it wasn't, you know, it, it was, you know, at first I thought, I thought my, at that time he was a boy, I thought he was gay and then he transgendered to a woman. And then, you know, I, I went through the process of, you know, absorbing all this because, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's not something you absorb one, two, three, but throughout this entire time, I was always supportive and loving and I stood by my child. And just like you are standing by your child, no matter what color or race or culture, right. they they realize that, they see that, they appreciate that, and they love that. And my child already has left to go to college right. and she is flourishing in college. And she always talks about how much she misses us and she wants oh. to come back. And, you know, so just like, you know, you're raising your son right now, doesn't matter what color or culture he is you know he sees how much you love him he sees everything you went through and he was there right next to you you both went through it together and that support and that love that you gave him that goes a long way and that will never be forgotten so I think what the outside world does doesn't really mean so much it's the world inside the family unit that means the most I think you know he'll develop that thick skin he'll learn what the world is about He'll learn ways to handle, you know, some abusive or verbal Mm -hmm. behaviors that he'll, he'll see in this world. But when it comes to his family life, if he came from a productive and healthy family life, he'll always come back and he'll always have an abundance of love for the people Mm -hmm. who supported and loved and cared for him. You should write a book too about your experience. (laughs) I mean, I bet it's another one of those, like, you know, you're trying to figure it out. You sort of don't know things happen and you have to, you know, 
adjust and deal and learn and love. Yeah. And uh, yeah, have you ever thought about writing a book? I was actually told by a lot of people that I should write a book about that because you go through a process, you know, it's yeah. not, you know, it's something I always knew, but it's, it's, it's hard when you raise a child as a boy and then all of a sudden your child, you know, transgender because they don't see themselves as a man. They see themselves as a, as a woman. And even my hairdresser who's gay said, you know, you don't choose this. He goes, if I had a magic wand, I'd be heterosexual. He says, you're born like this. And, you know, for me, it was like my, my, I, I had to mourn because in my eyes, I lost a son and gained a daughter. So it was a new beginning with a daughter and it was like the death of my son. Yeah. So, you know, I was like, where are the chapters in the book about this? I said, it went up to 12 months, but I said, now what? Now what? You know? <laughs> well, and it doesn't end, right? I mean, so like, you went through this whole learning process, but it's also going to be something, you know, for the rest of your life, you know, they're in college now, but what happens about marriage? And, you know, like, yeah. it's probably going to be a continual learning and adjustment and loving and figuring it out and yeah. joy and shock and sorrow and everything all together. Like, it right. never ends. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't. You know, it's it's it life, you know, especially, you know, being a parent, it, it never ends. It never ends. You know, there's a, there's always different things to worry about and, yeah. you know, problems to get, you know, th th it's just different problems and different things to go through in life. But the biggest thing is, is love, you know, as long mm -hmm. as that family bond is there and that love is there, love can conquer all. And, you know, and I, I love that you've written this book because, you know, you hear about adoption, you hear about all the, all the trauma people go through trying to adopt a child, but, you know, you actually were, you know, were blessed with a child and it doesn't matter the shade right. and the culture of the child, you know, who says a child has to be, you know, the same nationality. And, and if the child, if you were, if you were Greek or if you were Jewish and you had an, and you adopted Italian baby, what's the difference, you know, it's, you know, because yeah. they visually can't notice, they yeah. don't look through what's on the inside, they're looking on the outside, yeah. you know, and people, it's other people's problem, and yeah. they need to get through with it. Yeah. And it's yeah, I mean, like I always, I always feel, you know, I, I, I do like to hope that the book is a little bit of um, pro sort of interracial adoption. And, um, and, you know, I'll, I'll, parenting is like sorrow and joys and everything all together but but you know I, I and I certainly don't want to judge other people who like adopt a different way or don't want to adopt or whatnot um because while I'm sort of pro interracial adoption I, I feel like not enough people have even considered it or considered the foster system at the same time I mean I do want to say that I I agree with the idea that if you're gonna do something like this you have to make the effort to educate yourself and you have to make the effort to be aware of other cultures yes um, and it can be uh and you know on some level you know, if you're not willing to make the effort, then you should think harder about if you sort of want to adapt across cultures. So I think it's a wonderful, joyful, positive experience. Yeah. Um, but I do, after having gone through it as much as I have so far, do have a much greater understanding of why there are people who are, um, you know, against interracial adoption. I think they're against it because there are some people who aren't willing to learn and keep an open mind and make the effort. And, you know, we're saying like, you know, mother and you know love can overcome everything which is true but I do think it also it helps to have friends and you know like with my son there's the the talk about the police and how to deal with the police and that's already organically come up a few times with us but I actually enlisted a black male friend to talk to him about it because I thought he would hear it better from a person who looked like him right been through it so mm -hmm. like you know it, it takes all of us and to to do this stuff as a, as a community and 100 percent a little bit now but <laughs> no it's it's true you know if you have support from others that's what gets you through a lot of things in life you know you and and knowing that you're not alone knowing that other people are experiencing it and people that you could talk to and relate to it goes a long long way yeah 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 so yeah the more we can talk about these things and bring everybody on board with all our different perspectives the the better communication is the key and, you know, by you adopting this child, 
you were able to give this child a good life, a life that that child may not have had if they weren't, you know, if you weren't given the opportunity to adopt that child, you know, so, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, what color that, that child is, what skin color or, you know, what culture it's, it's, it, you know, what matters is that they're getting the love, the attention, and they're provided with the things they need in order to have a good life and a good future. And that's mm-hmm. exactly what you're doing right now is giving that child everything they need. And he made me a mother, right? So he gave me the yes the of motherhood and he uh, every day keeps me, uh, oh, you know, aware of things. I mean, th- this past weekend, he went to a Polo G concert. I didn't even know who Polo G was before. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning things. He's given me a lot of learning too. <laughs> now, has your book been published yet? Is it is it out now? So you can pre-order it on Kindle and it is in the middle of a Goodreads giveaway right now. If you're on Goodreads and want to sign up for a free um, e-giveaway of it, um, the paperback, the print version is not available till October 18th. So like one month from today, October okay. is all like the pre-press, but um, you can see the, the pages on, you know, Amazon and Barnes and Noble and whatnot, but it's officially available for a hard copy purchase October 18th. Now, what's your website address? Where can people um, uh, find you? Yeah, yeah. So the best place to learn about all of this is my website, which is www.layerachel, one word, which is L-E-A-R-A-C-H-E-L.com. And there you can even read like the first three chapters of the book if you want to just get a feel for it before you buy it. You can read the first three chapters of my previous books, some of my other writings and things that have been published. I have a blog as well. Um, and the book also, Seeking Forgiveness, right now it's being serialized. You can read even a few more than the first three chapters um, at the Racial Equity Storytelling Project before Ferguson, beyond Ferguson. So you can go to the, that website too to read the first couple chapters. Um, but yeah, my website has links to like all my writing and my blog, www.layerachel.com. Oh my God. It's been such a pleasure speaking with you. And, you know, I'm so glad you're able to talk about this subject because this is a topic that, you know, we really need to get more people aware of, you know, that, it, you know, it, you know, people can't really judge people by color. We need to judge people by their insides, by their heart, what's inside them, not what, how we look on the outside. And so many times our society gives people the perception that, you know, we are to judge people how they look on the outside. And we really need to see through that and, and really understand it's not how we look on the outside. It's what the person is on the inside, their heart, their, their actions, their behaviors, you know, that's what matters, you know, and, you know, it's, I I think this is great that you're, you've written this book and I wish you the best of luck. Tell everybody again what the title is so they don't forget. Seeking Forgiveness. Okay. And thank you for publicizing the book and just having, you know, a podcast where you talk about great things. I mean, it takes like, again, all of us. And so your willingness to have me on talk about seeking forgiveness is great. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. And I have to say, when it, when you talk about the word forgiveness before we go, I think people have to learn how to forgive. We need to forget the past. The past is the past. We cannot change the past. We need to look at the present and we need to work on changes in the present to make a beautiful future. And when we don't forgive, we hold we hold a brick, uh, uh, you know, over our shoulders, and we can't move on because it's we're it, that that brick is too heavy for us to walk, and we get stagnant in our own yeah. our own thoughts and our own you know mishaps, and you know it's it's all about forgiveness. The world becomes a better place when we can really understand how to forgive each other and start to love each other. Yeah. And it can be hard, but yeah. Yeah, it could be. It's it, forgiveness is a very hard thing. It is. it is a very hard thing. But, you know, I say baby steps, baby steps is the way. And, you know, eventually, if you really want, you really want to feel better, and you want to forgive, you know, and you want to move on, you know, you could do it. It's not nothing in this life is a one, two, three thing. Everything takes time, you know, but if if we can forgive the people, you know, around us or forgive, you know, our history and things that happen, so many good things could come about it. And we really need to, you know, start forgiving and stop holding grudges and stop, you know, let go of what we were taught and, and, and figure out a new way, a new, a new beginning. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think we definitely shouldn't forget what happened. We should understand history, but then yes, we should forgive and, and be able to move forward without forgetting the past, but trying to 
process, understand it. Yes. And try to build a better future for everybody. Uh, 100%. So one more time before we go, just tell everybody your title and your website, just so they don't forget. Yeah. The book is Seeking Forgiveness, a narrative memoir on interracial adoption. And you can read the first three chapters at www.layerachel, L-E-A-R-A-C-H-E-L, no spaces, dot com. It's been such a pleasure, Leah, to come on our show and to hear all this wonderful stuff that you provided us and to tell us about your book, you know, and I hope one day you can come back on the show and we can talk more about this subject. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you, Coach Stacey. Thank you so much. You too. Have a great day. Take care.